Hello, everyone, and welcome to another session of Regen Civics. Today, we're going to get a little bit more into the legal side of life, which is really interesting for a lot of us. Um, before I do that, I just want to do some context setting real quick, because this is really valuable, because this first season has been pretty chaotic. So I, uh, let me see if I can help ground this a little bit. Does everyone see the roadmap coordination patterns and seasons here? Uh, yes. Yep. Cool. So this is our knowledge base. So this is going to give us an idea of where we're at. So just a real quick recap for those who already know this. This is a region civics year where first we're in the winter start of it, which is the incubator, which is what we're part of right now. So this is when we're going through the process of actually designing our economies and organizations, etc. And then after that will be the spring season, which is when we actually do the crowd pooling. So after we're ready, then we'll go out there, announce it. It's a lot about storytelling, a lot of hype, you know, bringing people to our project, inviting people in, and it's a lot of growth. And then summer is when we're actually on the ground building our festivals. So this is when we bring people on site for running the festival to build the project and do whatever it is we're doing. And then fall is when the harvest festival happens where we learn about everything we just did over the last three seasons and get ready for the next season. <clears throat> That's a real quick overview of the whole map of where we're headed. Uh, we don't know how long each season is going to take, this being the first year, so we're figuring it out. So where are we in the winter season? Um, again, because this was the first season, things have been a little bit intense. I hear the expression drinking from a fire hose often. Uh, future projects won't necessarily have that because they'll be able to come back and watch. <laughs> Um, they'll be able to watch these episodes and get a little bit of this context. So what I had mentioned at the beginning of this was I was just going to real quick, and that's what we've been doing so far, touch on each one of these topics. And now I think it might be helpful to slow down and actually come back and circle back and make sure we're ticking every one of these off. So one of the big things we needed was that contributor guide. So people know how to contribute to your project, what it means to be a member, what is membership, you know, the very basic questions that everyone at your project needs to have answered in order for them to show up fully at your project. And then the other thing was the economic and token economic, depending on what you're designing, um, structures. So that's what we've been talking about recently. Uh, what we're going to start talking about today is the legal structures. So how do we relate with you know, legacy economies and with other types of economic systems? And then after that, we'll step into the organization structures a little bit, still kind of the fire hose method. So I'll kind of give a big overview of what's possible um, and we can see what we form. And then after that, we'll go through some foundational policies. So we've talked a lot about policies so far in this season, and these are agreements that the community makes that are really important in order to hold that community to account and hold to a certain particular form that you guys are trying to build. Uh, that was a way too broad way of trying to explain that, but we'll get into that later. And then right after that is when we'll start preparing for the crowd pooling. So this would be similar to like a Kickstarter campaign where you might have different benefits for different contribution categories, et cetera. We'll start designing all of that. And then when we're done with that, that's when the crowd pooling will actually begin. So I'll give you a little context of where we're at today. So we've touched on again a lot of these topics, but we'll circle back around and make sure that all the projects are fully aware and are happy with their designs before we get to that crowd pooling phase. Um, so any questions about where we're at or what to expect going forward? I know that was, again, a lot, but hey. Nope. Okay, so I'll share this with you. You can dive into it more and learn more about seasons and patterns and all that stuff, if you would like. All right, so as you guys might see, we have a, another guest here today who's a new face, John, and maybe Charlie, you can even introduce him because that'll be next. Sorry, I'm skipping a step. Does anyone have any announcements or anything they'd like to share before we kick off today? And then we'll get into the legal discussion. Oh, easy. Okay, so then Charlie, if you wanna introduce the guest and where he's coming from, he'll share about community land trusts and some of the wisdom he's gained over the last really long time. John, you're incredible. Um, and we can learn from that. There'll be a session for asking questions from John, and we can discuss community land trusts, and then we'll pass it over to Will, and he's going to talk about the 508C structure. And then after that, there might be a couple more presentations about different legal structures. So we'll just go back and forth, present presenter, some Q&A for that presenter, that'll close, we'll move on to the next one. And then if we have time at the end of this, I can help wrap up some questions about economic design and tokenomics. 
um, at the end of this session if we have time. Any questions about what to expect today or any changes to that flow before we get started? Nope. Then with no further ado, I'll pass it to Charlie and then you can introduce John and then we'll send it to John. Thanks. Uh, so we're actually lucky to have uh, two people from the Center of CLT Innovation today. We've got John and Greg. Um, both have copious amounts of experience in uh, community land trusts broadly across the world, but mostly with the USA focus and lots of active experience from how to organize, fund, give advice. They sit there at this uh, sort of global network position of advising CLTs popping up all over the place, but through their um, Terra Nostra Press, their public publication arm, <coughs> have done lots of thinking and coordinating on how to advise trusts around the world and set a lot of the definitions and helped a lot with the legal definitions that have appeared out all over the world. So when you asked us, can we have more details on land trusts, I thought, let's go with some people that uh, are really touching a lot of these projects and can, can give that overview. Um, so I asked John if he would step in and, and help us understand the breadth of this movement, uh, where it comes from and how it's touching the current day and showing up in different places. So over to John. Okay, am I gonna be able to share my screen? Have you given me the power? I will give it a try. You should have it, yep. Okay, yes I do, very good. Okay, let's see. We can move that down to, to here and start this, and I will uh, let you from start. All right, how are we doing? Are you able to hear me and see my screen? Check and check. Yes, okay. I never quite, all right, I never quite know. I am a bit of a techno klutz, as my colleagues at the center uh, are well aware, so I often mess this kind of stuff up. Um, I thought I'd just start by giving you a glimpse at the organization that Charlie referred to, the Center for CLT Innovation. Um, we've been around for a while that we formally incorporated in 2018 in order to support the global growth of community land trust. And um, we do three primary things. One, we've got our own imprint, as Charlie mentioned, Terra Nostra Press. Um, we're trying to, I mean, most of our publications are in English, but we're also uh, coming forth with several publications in Spanish. And the, uh, the first books on CLT is published in Spanish. We also, uh, maintain a comprehensive library of technical and educational materials, almost all of it for free, all of it accessible, and we're trying to multiply the languages there as well, so it's not just uh, English-centric. And we also do a number of convenings, peer-to-peer um, -peer trainings, uh, virtual events where we're looking at new applications and new structures for the CLT. And then last year, we had a worldwide celebration of World CLT Day that we hope to repeat in the future. We have a board of directors that is drawn from a number of countries. Right now, I think we're too um, heavily dominated by North America, so we're going to be diversifying our board even more over the coming year, including me stepping down as the president. Uh, we thought that it probably sends the wrong message to the world to have the president of an international organization being in North America, being in the U.S. in particular. So Charlie asked me just to give a brief overview of community land trust, so I will do that quite quickly and leave lots of time for Q&A. Um, he first mentioned that uh, I was going to say where it came from. Well, the first modern day community land trust that uh, most of the movement points to is New Communities Incorporated that was formed in 1969. It emerged out of the struggle for civil rights in the American South. But 
those African-American pioneers look to a number of examples, precursors in other countries that they liberally borrowed ideas from and mixed them together to create the modern day community land trust. In particular, they look to England, Mexico, Israel, and India. We estimate at this point that there are over 530 community land trusts around the world. Um, we try to maintain an ongoing directory and map of uh, those CLTs. We are always behind because there are new community land trusts being formed constantly. So we're always about six months behind as we try to update our map and our directory. Um, the majority of CLTs are still concentrated in the United States. There are over 300, 320 CLTs. And even though the first community land trusts that were created were rural, the majority are urban now uh, in the United States and around the world. And they're to be found in cities, in regions, in suburbs and islands. So almost any place you could uh, create a community land trust, somebody is creating one exactly there. Um, the model in the last 20 years has spread to the global north outside the US in uh, Canada, Australia, Belgium, and England in particular, but it's also starting to spread to the global south particularly uh, given the example in Puerto Rico of a very successful CLT, the Caño Martin Peña CLT in San Juan that was created in an, uh, a collection of informal settlements there on the edge of the financial district in San Juan, what we call in the United States squatter communities, um, but informal settlements is a more accurate term. Here's the elevator speech. You know, there's a lot of diversity about what is a community land trust, what a community land trust does, but the most generic definition is community-led development on community-owned land of housing and other land-based assets that remain permanently affordable. And when you combine those elements, this is how you end up with this model. You can't concentrate just on any one element. You really have to concentrate simultaneously on the community aspect, the land aspect, the holding land and buildings in trust aspect. The um, C in CLT, community, um, you know, has a lot of variations around the world. The what we sometimes call the classic model is a uh, NGO that is has a board of directors that is controlled by the residents of a place-based community. And CLTs will draw their line around those geographies, sometimes very narrowly, sometimes quite broadly. But anyone who happens to live or work within that designated geography can become a voting member of this NGO. But we also reserve a big block of seats for the people who are actually on the land, okay? So that a majority of the governing board really is accountable to, governed by, elected by the people who live in their targeted geography. Now, most CLTs in the early days were started from scratch, brand new nonprofit uh, corporations, but today, an increasing number of CLTs in the United States and elsewhere are grafted on to a pre-existing NGO where there's an internal program or even a subsidiary that functions as a community land trust. Here's the L in, um, in CLT. The NGO holds on to the land. It acquires land that either already has buildings on it or vacant land. And then it sells off the buildings that are located on the land to single family homeowners, to cooperatives, to other NGOs, to small businesses. So it's a mixed ownership model with an NGO holding onto the land and then selling off the improvements on the land using either a ground lease or surface rights deed to give the owners of the building right of security, I mean, a secure use of the land underneath 
their holdings underneath their feet. So here's why the NGO hangs on to the land and never resells it. Because first of all, it wants to give that place-based community say over how the land is used, what is done with the land, who the land and the buildings on the land benefit. So there's a priority for equitable development. Who benefits? Primarily, the people who benefit are those who have been ex rejected, excluded from the economic and political mainstream. It gives them a voice in saying who benefits from the land holdings of the CLT. But it's not just important to say who benefits, but how long. And in community land trust, this idea of equitable development and sustainable development are two sides of the same coin. We never have one without the other. And the way we talk about sustainability, the way we talk about longevity in the world of CLTs is stewardship. And we sometimes talk about the three faces of stewardship, that even though the NGO that owns the land doesn't own the buildings on the land, it has a durable right to protect the affordability on that land to protect the quality, the condition of the buildings on the land, to protect security of tenure of the people who live on its land. Yeah, so we talk about that as the three faces of stewardship. And increasingly, the one in the middle is being given increasing amounts of attention by CLTs around the world, where they're saying, look, we may not own the buildings on our land, but we want to say that whatever is built on our land is going to be built correctly. It's going to be built through, you know, green construction. It's using the best materials that are going to last a long, long time and with a focus on energy efficiency. Yeah, so we're moving toward a just transition. We're building green principles into the built environment. This is our thumbnail description of what the CLT does in its role as the trustee. Um, our former executive director of a CLT in Albuquerque, New Mexico, used to describe the CLT as we are the developer that doesn't go away. Because what we've discovered over time is that it's not enough just to slap a bunch of restrictions on those buildings slap a bunch of restrictions on the land, there has to be an active, vigilant, diligent steward standing behind the deal to make sure that it endures, to make sure that people are not displaced, to make sure the buildings are kept in good repair, and to make sure that affordability continues one occupant after another, one homeowner after another in perpetuity. That's my thumbnail overview of the Community Land Trust. And let me just acknowledge that there is an enormous amount of variation in this model from one country to another, from one city to another, uh, sometimes from one neighborhood to another within the same city. So I kind of gave you a generic overview of the model, but I should acknowledge that there's a lot of variation, a lot of diversity. Okay, let me stop scare it sharing my screen and um, let you go back to your gathering. And um, are there any questions that I might be able to answer? And I think Greg is still with us, my colleague at the, uh, oh yeah, I see Greg, from the Center for CLT Innovation, who has been doing community land trust work uh, about as long as I have. So how may we help? Oh, John, that was great. Um, first question was, can you get the slides and put them in the, is it possible to share them in the chat or share them at all? Because then people could follow up with the incredible oh, Yeah, of course. Um, any other questions for John? Any more pointed questions or anything like that? Or Greg, I saw you come on if you would like to speak as well. 
you know, I'd say the center's kind of business model, the extent that we have it is we give everything away. So uh, we will certainly give away our slides and um, all the other materials. Um, we sell our books, but even those we sell for a minimal price to try to make them very accessible, very affordable for people, particularly around the world. Um, I'm going to respond quickly to that because our business model is to also give away tokens for people who have contributed to this movement. Uh, the <laughs> movement being humanity switching from the civilizations that it's in to the next one. So we would love to, and I can follow up with you after, like look at what it looks like to give the center some tokens from Regen Civics to acknowledge the contributions that you guys have made. Um, so I'd love to follow up with that. Uh, but Anders, you have your hand up, so I'll send it over to you. Hey, thanks so much, John. Really um, appreciate you being here with us today. It's, uh, I mean, I, I can't even imagine how much work has gone into all of this from from so many people over the years. And it's so, 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 like, we're all so blessed, right, to have the opportunity to learn from this and incorporate this and help, you know, each other. Um, my question is around um, business models and and how and because I'm, I'm doing more than just having a community i'm kind of cr i'm creating a community around the business models that we're developing on the land so how does this model um relate to potential businesses that are being created on the land and i'm also curious with regard to liability of uh, things happening within those business models on the land uh from you know those different um um yeah from those different individuals cooperatives or nonprofit you know owners yeah well greg is an attorney and i will let him deal with the uh, the question of liability um to the extent that we have experience uh in the clt movement um as far as the business model of individual clts um you know it's they try to diversify their streams of revenue uh, as much as they can. Almost all of them start out uh, highly dependent on uh, foundation grants for operations, government grants for operations and for projects, um, low interest loans from community loan funds and the like. And you know, over time, to the extent that they're serving very low income people, they are still accessing those pub public dollars. Uh, anytime they can. They're also partnering with municipal governments um, that where municipal governments are using the police power, for instance, inclusionary zoning, uh, regulatory benefits, density bonuses, things like that, that themselves create value. They're partnering with the municipal government to basically become the stewards of those units that the government has helped to create. Right. I mean, the, the great fallacy of inclusionary zoning and density bonuses and parking waivers and all of that in the United States is we create affordable housing and then it dribbles away within five years on the first resale. So we have a number of CLTs, such as the one in Petaluma, California, that not only partner with government to be the steward of those assets created by government, but they're actually paid by government to perform that service, to perform that stewardship service. And then, you know, CLTs charge a ground lease fee for the land that they're making available underneath their buildings. So for low-income homeowners, those lease fees are nominal. For a business or for a 50-unit rental, uh, structure on their um, on their land, uh, those lease fees can be quite substantial. Uh, so the best I can say is that it varies from one CLT to another, and it tends to be a diverse array of public, private, and internal resources. You know, we try to encourage them to diversify as much as possible, put all your eggs in one basket, and government changes its mind, and you're left out in the cold. Greg, do you want to say something about liability? Yeah. So, uh, well, greetings, everybody. Um, liability works a couple different ways. The CLT can serve a land owning function and then lease the land to for all sorts of different uses. So in that case, 
Um, you know, liability is protected through the ground lease agreement, which usually includes, may include an indemnification clause and insurance policies, that kind of thing. It's different if the community land trust itself is operating the business or is running the project that's on the ground. Um, you know, and again, liability, it depends liability to who. There's organizational liability, there's individual liability of investors, that types of things. And that'll vary quite a bit country to country based on legal systems. So I think, you know, again, CLTs can either be, you know, purely serve a land holding function and then lease that out for a variety of uses, or the CLT could offer programs itself, or it could do both. Does that answer your question, Anders? Managed, managed to address that, yes. <laughs> awesome. Uh, I had a quick reflection to that, though, because I heard a, a basic model here where it's the CLT owns the land, and then if it's doing something that's worth being a charity, which all of us are doing because we're building regenerative projects, healing the environment, social good, et cetera, that it's actually the charity that rents the land from the CLT so that funds that come in could be tax deductible and then that's what pays the lease for the land. I've heard of that model. I just want to get you guys' opinions on that basic structure where the charity sits on top, is the one that's running the business, so to speak. It's not a business in this case, it's a charity, but they're the ones that's leasing the land from the CLT. Right. Maybe Greg, if you want to respond because you're mean, nodding. You, yeah, you could do that. I mean, most CLTs are themselves the charity. Most CLTs that, you know, most of the entities that own the land are themselves tax exempt organizations. They operate, they behave, they are taxed as charities. Yeah. So, but there is nothing that says that the community land trust could not lease its land to another charity. And that happens quite often. Greg, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, like uh, particularly in the case where the CLT doesn't have the requisite expertise in house. So in my experience, um, we were involved in a project that kind of contains many of the elements of an eco village, but we had no expertise in terms of natural areas restoration um, or agriculture, which were features of the project. And so in that case, we partnered with an or another organization that did and we uh, entered into a ground lease with them at a very nominal fee. And then, you know, so that's way you could kind of expand beyond whatever your in-house expertise is for your CLT um, by partnering in, in a manner like that. And that was one charity leasing to another charity. Yes. Correct. And, and just one thing to, to point out is that you know, wherever possible, where you could partner with existing organizations, um, it's always a good idea because they have the familiarity with the area, they've got the connections, um, they have the kind of uh, real estate transaction experience, and that could save you quite a bit of time from doing everything from scratch. So, of course, there needs to be kind of a compatibility of mission um, but, you know, just kind of plopping down in an area with a whole new effort um, without any local partners is, is quite a challenge. But, you know, the, by hanging on to the land and parcels of land that are scattered throughout a certain designated geography, you know, the land trust, it's, it doesn't just do one thing. Right. So the same NGO, the same community land trust may own dozens of parcels of land scattered throughout its designated geography. Some of those parcels are used for owner occupied housing. Some are used for rental. Some are used for urban ag or small businesses. So it gives you an enormous amount of flexibility um, in promoting a diversity of uses all of which will serve the community, all of which will remain affordable and accessible for the next generation. Because, you know, in a gentrifying neighborhood, you don't just lose housing, 
You don't just lose affordable housing. You lose uh, community gardens. You lose your barbershops. You, you lose your hardware stores. So, you know, all of those things are pushed out. So a community land trust that really wants to do neighborhood revitalization, neighborhood regeneration is going to look at more than just housing. Epic. Um, I see Anders has his hand up. If anyone else has any questions, get your hand up. We'll have room for maybe two or three more questions. Um, just a quick context setting um, and a question for you guys. One, all the projects here that we're working with, we're working with 13 different ones, they already own the land. And right now, the owners are looking for a structure to put that into in order to bring in additional investors and or et cetera. You guys get that. Um, second, they're all trying to be all encompassing, kind of like a neighborhood, but more like a, a different economy. So they are trying to see how can we meet all the needs of the participants within this community land trust so we can create circular economies, localize our food systems, and do all those things that humanity needs to do. So that's part of the exploration we're going on. So then my question to you all would be, if any of these 13 projects would like to set up a community land trust, do you guys have like an accelerator, an incubator, or some type of process where they can apply for it? And then you can take them on that journey in their context, or do you know of a group doing this or anything like that? Oh, hey. Um... Well, there's no, <laughs> there's not much of a cookie cutter approach here. It's not kind of a standard path, um, you know. In the situation where you've already got the land and the owner of the land would like to use the land uh, for a regenerative um, approach, it seems to me that if that person, the landowner, is interested in the C and CLT, one of the places to begin is to be, you know, to be consulting with the people who live around that land, who might live on the land, who might use the land. I mean, that's kind of the starting place for most CLTs as they build their organization. Otherwise, you've got a great project. You know, it's like you, <laughs> you build your field of dreams and you kind of wonder who's going to come. Greg, do you have a, an insight into, into that? Well, I, I'm just kind of holding on to the word investors, right? And the, kind of in a CLT context, investors tend to be permanent investors, right? Because the only way affordability is going to happen is if you don't need to pay back everybody who's put money into the project. You know, that's one of the challenges. So you know, um, and in terms of, you know, if investors are going to be repaid and then their lenders and then, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a different approach than certainly the conventional CLT. You know, I've certainly been talking with Charlie about it for quite a while now to figure out how to blend the two approaches. I think it just needs more exploration than we're going to be able to do in the next 30 seconds, you know, so. Fair enough, last plug and I'll send it to Anders. Uh, we might be able to follow up or we'll have Charlie do it, but that's what we're trying to do here in this accelerator is using a lot of the web three, you know, DAOs and tokens and all that stuff world to be able to do that blending. So in the legal situation, we might have a community land trust, but then in this, you know, web three token digitized world, we could have a different type of economic logic that's, you know, acting, if that makes sense. Um, so anyway, that is a further exploration. I'll send sure. to Anders for his question, and then we'll send it to Tucker. And then I want to thank you guys for showing up. So Anders. Yeah. I'm curious um, if it's hard to maintain the CLT legal structure. Like how time intensive is it? Do I need a lawyer to like handle that every year? Or like, what does that look like? Yeah. Okay. You have to do your filings, um, you know, your tax filings and things like that. But, you know, most community land trusts in the United States and elsewhere have been incorporated under either a state, provincial or federal law. And once it's set up, it's a matter of reporting. It's not a matter of continually reinventing the organization. Is that what you're asking? I'm not quite. Yeah. Yeah. Greg, you. Yeah. Yeah, I think. So whenever you have a transaction of some kind, 
And then working with an attorney is generally a good idea, in my opinion. So and that could be uh, a real estate transaction that could be entering into a long-term ground lease. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. I, personally, I think it's a good idea to consult with an attorney just in case, because that just saves you a lot of time and trouble if there's ever a dispute or problem down the road. So, but no, you don't have to do an annual legal audit. Um, depending on your sources of funding, you may need to do an, an annual financial audit that some funders would require. Yeah, the legal involvement tends to be front-loaded, right? They, you know, most CLTs use attorneys more at the front end with the exception of transactional um, right. you know, consultations. But you know, you're, it's good to have an attorney to advise on the ground lease, on the incorporate, you know, the articles of incorporation, the bylaws, things like that. Um, but once you've set it up, once you've set up the scaffolding, um, it's up. You, know, you don't have to rebuild it every year. I would just throw one other thing. You, we, you know, in terms of the Web3, that really changes the legal dimension of the project quite a bit in terms of how do you interface between kind of the real world on the ground legal structures and then the Web3 world. And, and so I've been following that a bit and that that's where things can get tricky. And I think that, I think the state of the art is still evolving in that regard, as far as I could tell. And then, you know, I'm kind of wondering whether you could leave the land alone, but use the investment opportunity just for the construction and the long-term financing of the buildings. Um, anyway, it's just a, an idea I would throw out because you're right. We want to put the land in the portfolio debt-free. We don't want to encumber that, but the improvements, right. the capital improvements, the buildings are another matter. And there's an investment opportunity there and an opportunity to take investors out at the back end years down the road. So there may be an opportunity there if we build on the strength of the model, which is a dual ownership model. Hmm. Oh, I'm just <laughs> I'm just guessing. I'm just making that up on the fly. <laughs> which I tend to do. And I then I turn over to the attorneys and say, hey, you work it out. <laughs> that's that's what we're making up on the fly too that it would be two models you'd have the clt with the land and then something else whether that's a charity again or a, and whatever you get it um tucker you got some hands up yes yeah <clears throat> yes um so i joined a little late here so i missed the beginning of the presentation so i hope i'm not asking something that was already answered uh, but our project is already using uh, land trusts to achieve what we're trying to achieve with intentional communities. And I was wondering, I keep hearing the term CLT, community land trust. Is that a private express trust or is this some other form of trust that I'm not familiar with? Uh, it's, uh, trust is a misnomer. Trust refers to behavior rather than structure. So it's not a legal trust. It's not a real estate trust. It's either a nonprofit organization, a charity that holds the land. So um, that was something that <laughs> we've been in trouble with a number of times uh, because people look at it and say, God, you're setting up these uh, real estate trusts. Well, we're really not. And there's also, just to be clear, there's a difference between a community land trust and then a conservation land trust. And maybe, John, if you could say a few words about that. Well, it really, it tends to be on what they do, you know, what they do with their land. But many of the conservation land trusts in the U.S. and elsewhere are structured similarly. I mean, they're a nonprofit organization. They hold land. They act as a steward. Uh, it's just not building a lot of buildings on their land. So are, are you guys using a, a specific IRS tax code entity, like charity entity for this? Or because, I mean, we are using an actual like private express land trust as its own legal entity. So I'm just trying to get clarification on the entity that you guys are using. And which which country are you in? I'm sorry. I United States. Ah, ah okay. <laughs> I, 
I got it. Uh, no, these are nonprofit corporations that are incorporated under the, you know, corporate statute for each state. Okay. So there are generally they, still these. I'm sorry, and, they, and then they seek a 501c3 designation from the IRS uh, if they gotcha. if they have a charitable purpose, and not all community land trusts do, but 99% of them do. Okay. All but as far as as we know in the U.S., I think. Yeah, so. I'm sorry, I interrupted you, Greg. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say 501c3. There's one land trust, community land trust, that utilizes a 501c4 structure because they don't want to be held, they want to be confined to a charitable purpose. Um, but in the same, uh, but since. CLPs in the U.S. by and large are doing affordable housing. They're quite a good fit for 501c3 status. Not C4. What is it? C2? I get C2. It's C2. It's C2. Yeah. Excuse me. C2. Okay. Well, I think you answered my question. Thank you very much. Awesome. Um, thanks, Tucker. We'll send over to Will or Stephen, whichever one of you has your hand up. It was me. Um, are we are we transitioning into my little presentation on the Universe Spiritual Ministry, the five hundred eight C one A, or are we holding space for more Q and A on this? Um, you was you were the last Q and A, so if you don't have anything else, then we can thank them for showing up here today. And we already shared your website in the chat. And yeah, we really appreciate you guys showing up, bringing your wisdom to this, and uh, definitely all the decades of experience you guys have put into exploring this realm. So. Deep gratitude, Greg and John, for showing up here. And thank you, Charlie, for bringing them to the table. If you guys would have right. any last minute nice things you would like to share, then feel free, and then we'll transition to Will. Oh. Know, let's create space for someone else. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, thank John, you, John, and Greg. Thank you, Greg. Awesome. Will. And, and Tucker, thank you for the question, because this is what I wanted to know as well, whether you guys were actually a trust or whether you're using the word trust and operating as a... As a, as a Nonprofit 503, um, 501c3a. Um, and this, this leads me nicely onto the topic of conversation now, which is a 508c1a. Um, it's a spiritual church ministry that has assumed the, the rights of a 50c1, 50c1a. Full, full charity nonprofit. Yeah. So, so just by being a spiritual ministry, we uh, benefit from all of the um, advantages of being a nonprofit organization, but we are not governed by state. And this is the biggest difference. And I think this is why, why Tucker was asking you guys whether you're a charity registered with state or whether you're a trust in the private jurisdiction, because this is the distinction that we all need to understand very clearly about how we're going to move forward. Are we moving forward and, and surrendering to state and to government and saying, yep, you can regulate us because we're operating as an entity within your jurisdiction? Or are we bringing our landing to our jurisdiction, that of our community, which is what the decentralized Web 3.0 movement is supposed to be about and what all these tools are for? Self-governing, self-distribution, value, you know, all the things. Um, so, Reiki, if you can share or make me a host, I can share a screen and just talk through um, a one-page document I created to assist in this presentation Reiki asked me to do. You can share it. Days anyway. ago, I haven't got a beautiful slide presentation. Um, I just have one document to share screen. Uh, start broadcast. Three, two, one. Okay, can we see my screen? Anyone say yes or no, thumbs up? I can't um, I see a URL so, we'll your screen, so maybe actually take it to what you want to show with us and we'll see if it takes us there. Which is, which is so now can you all see the document Why okay. I Love the Universe? It just came up. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, just context, a 508C1A is a way of, uh, being recognized by state saying hey we do exist we are alive we are operating we're an organization um, 
and then being able to access traditional tools, which I'll go into in a little bit, a little bit, a bit like how a corporation or a non-profit or a charity can access the banking infrastructure and so on and so forth. Um, but it's it's a distinction of separation. Uh, um, this this here is like. A compilation of things and reasons and benefits as to why this is the choice that we have made as the Universe Land Trust, uh, of which Starseed Village is one of our land-based projects here in Guatemala, as well as uh, land-based projects in Nicaragua and the United States. Uh, the land is owned by the Spiritual Church Ministry, and then we're using blockchain technology to govern and distribute value and, and regulate and create our own agreements, which can be a conservation zone, a, a preservation zone affordable housing, pretty much anything that the CLT has already done and their beautiful explanation of how to be a community-led development on community-owned land. Um, all of this structure can be done, but without being underneath the state and therefore being regulated. Um, so I'm just going to read off these and we can expand on them if anyone wants. Freedom of speech, sacred medicine. So this means that all of our members have the right to work with plant medicine, uh, which includes marijuana, um, psilocybin um, mushrooms, ayahuasca, peyote. Um, but yeah, the, the, list, the list goes on. If it's sacred medicine, if it's for ceremony, if it's for, for medicine, for healing, we have the right as, a, as members uh, to use it, to travel with it, to grow it, to exchange it. Um, promissory notes, this is an interesting one. According to our declaration, each member can create promissory notes. This is... Um, Potentially a way to create jubilee debt. Anyone that wants to pay off their debt, this is something we're exploring right now. Um, private jurisdiction. This is the thing that Tuck has been going on about with being a private trust. Once you incorporate yourself, you are you are um, saying that you you agree to the regulation of that thing that you're um, incorporating under. Whereas in the private jurisdiction, you get to create your own bylaws, your own ecclesiastical courts. In our case, that's the universe, um, which enables us to have internal conflict resolution. Um, and for my personal desire, one of the things that led me to, to this knowledge and to this, this, this mission, this purpose, this, this type of co-creation was my love for spirit. So everything that we are doing is in the name of spirit. Um, we have declarations, tenants, creeds and principles. So as a ministry, you have the freedom to create your own. Um, which, yeah, just is an extension of the Tribunal for Dis uh, Dispute Resolution, the, the bylaws, the rights that you have between you and your creator. So it's, it's true sovereignty, true freedom. Uh, rights to create your own agree agreements. Unincorporated, this is the key that I keep coming back to. Uh, religious freedoms gives extensive rights. If you want to learn more about that, and uh, I recommend reading our declaration or getting creative about creating your own. Uh, the seeds constitution, for example, could easily be used to set up a 508C1A of this nature. Um, it it's, uh, gives us the right to create licensing. Um, this, this is for doctors, for health practitioners, for healers, for medicine workers, but also for the development of the land, the regenerative principles that need to be followed for building and developing on, on, on the physical uh, community site. Um, we're tax exempt. We can receive tax deductible donations. We have mandatory exemption rights from filing tax returns. We can write off property taxes. We're a membership organization which serves as a spiritual PMA. So you, like the 508 makes a, makes a trust kind of redundant, makes a, another type of PMA kind of redundant because you can create your own PMA. You can create your own trust. You can create your own conservation zone. Uh, we're unregulated by SEC because we are separate from state. It's the natural man um, thesis. If anyone knows much about that, they can, you can find a lot about it on YouTube. Um, terminating old contracts and agreements with anyone and any entity, including agencies and governments. So if you are in a position where, where you've uh, been behaving unconsciously, perhaps, and you've uh, agreed to things that are not serving you, joining a ministry, creating a declaration of your own, um, operating in the private realm separates you from that. Uh, you can terminate any previous agreement that's not serving you. Um, and yeah, extension of that is the inviolable rights and unity on our land. So uh, 
the protection is very extensive just for a member that's on our physical site. Um, there's also extensive non-liability for our board members. Um, you really uh, wanted to go do a travel documentation. That's I skipped the travel documentation because we haven't manifested it yet, um, but it's it's on the way. We're, we're officially registering uh, the, ch the church ministry here in Guatemala. It will take six months. At the end of that process, we can uh, create um, temporary residencies for one to five years and permanent residencies at the end of that five year period. So any member that comes to join our land based project can get residency. Um, but yeah, we do have the right to create our own travel documentation for, for transport, getting it recognized by immigration and airlines is a whole other thing. Um, but when we have in the future, the, the plan is to have a private transport network connecting all of these land based projects together and, and using the seeds passport applications recognition. So, you know, it's, we can get creative. Um, but as it comes to missionaries and ministers, we have the rights for diplomatic passports and residencies. As I just mentioned, we're testing that in Guatemala and also in Bali right now. Um, it empowers members to act, serve, and sign in the name of the universe so that they, they can do things in the name of the ministry as opposed to in the name of themselves, um, which is protecting the assets because all of the property is in, in the name of God Almighty, held in trust and under stewardship by the director, minister, and, and members. Um, members, missionary stewards, um, uh, ministers, executive ministers, they can all receive... Um, a stipend and a uh, budget for living expenses. It's already internationally recognized. There is a few countries on the blacklist I've listed those. Um, yeah, we get an EIN number to own assets, including land. We have the right to act as a guarantor, using the ministry assets as a guarantee for its members, which gives us the right to access loans and other financial instruments, which we currently have already. Tax exempt accounts with WISE, so that's 50 plus currencies. We have an account with OpenNode, which enables us to use their API to instantly convert Bitcoin to local currency for uh, as a one percent processing fee. Um, but it's instant conversion to dollars and euros right now. They're working on the pound and other currencies. Um, we can convert dollars into Bitcoin, also for a one percent processing fee with Swan Bitcoin. We have a PayPal account, a Stripe account, a Bank of America account, a credit union account. Other banks recognize us too. Um, so to bring this back to be really relevant for the land-based projects here is how can we integrate this with the DHO? Um, and this doesn't have to be applied for a spiritual ministry. It could be any form of, of uh, agreement that states the private jurisdiction this is where tucker is, is like i keep saying him because he's he's nailing this home it's about unincorporation so by joining the dho we're, we're agreeing to join a private membership or organization association whatever it might be call it a spiritual pma or, or whatever you want to call it when they join the dho that means all activity within that organization is within the private jurisdiction of that private association in this case the ministry um so and asking about lawyers and getting the response of yeah you have to file tax returns and deal with lawyers all the time we, we know the old world process is contacting a lawyer choosing an entity type filing paperwork dealing with the government having articles of association issuing says paying every time you want to change anything or the, the time and the, and, and the energy to, to do it we know it exists it's the old way the new way is starting a DHO, a decentralized organization, opting into a private membership association, or in this case, the ministry, get instant access to banking, instant access to the Web 3.0 crypto space. Um, and we, we as the universe ministry are offering our framework for conscious and regenerative organizations. That means nonprofit ESG organizations making a positive impact in the world. That can be locally and or globally. Um, and are giving the majority of their resource to the community and a cause or mission in alignment with our intentions. Um, this is the way that we've structured it because we're truly not trying to set up a loophole to try and do things that are damaging. We are really serving this regenerative movement and we want to offer our framework to people that are operating within that, uh, yeah, that, that realm, you know, the regenerative movement. So if you want to set something up in a degenerative way, this can still apply fine but if you want to plug and play with us then this is what we ask it's conscious and regenerative organizations only 
non-profit ESG. Um, the process to joining with us is making a vow. This is like our KYC, our AML. It's our way of making sure that um, we're onboarding and getting to know our members um, and also finding out which intentions they're aligned with and why, you know, why they're making this, this, uh, this decision to join us. Um, an oath um, and then gathering, you know, monthly, quarterly, yearly. Um, this, this doesn't have to be um, mandatory. Everything is optional, but coming together and uh, organizing is, is necessary. So, um, yeah, that's what we ask for our partners is to come together monthly, quarterly and yearly. And I think I'll stop there. The last bit just kind of goes on to our um, structure to make sure that the organizations we do partner with are operating ethically and um, how we deal with internal conflict, internal uh, resolution. We have our extellectual, extellectual courts, the tribu tribunal of the universe. Uh, we're setting up a council of elders. Uh, we have many, many Starseed members that connect with the Galactic Federation and the Council of Light. Um, and yeah, the DAO is the way. Uh, I'll stop there. I'll pause for any questions. I'm really grateful for Reiki for this invitation to share what we've been up to because every time we come to this call, we hear a lot of challenges and problems in the legal realm that we seem to have solved. And we're offering this to, to you guys to, yeah, basically remove a lot of the, the friction and the regulation and the problems that you're coming up against. The solution is here. We've been living it. And yeah, we're really excited to share it. So thank you very much, Reiki. And um, over to you guys for questions. Bravo, bravo. Good job. Yeah, I think we start with lead with acknowledgement here. Well done. Very inspiring. Thank you. And maybe just a comment of something that helped me capture this was I've been hearing about this 508C structure for feels like a decade. And when I first heard about it, I'm like, this is a scam. This isn't true. You know, this seems like ridiculous. But then you dive into it more and you realize that the Catholic Church and other really powerful churches, you know, when we are setting up incorporation and nation states were doing that, they intentionally didn't want to be bound by those nation states rules and they were able to build a structure that serves them which essentially means we're going to operate outside of the nation state boundaries as long as everyone agrees to that. So if you're part of a church, you say, I'm not going to be dealing with the nation state courts anymore. I'm choosing to opt out of the rules and restrictions and those things that exist to protect me because the SEC, as they state, it's there to protect people. You know, the SEC isn't there to like, you know, infringe on your rights. At least they, you know, they say they're not supposed to be doing that. So when you say I opt out of those protections, you know, the nation state's rules, then you can opt into a new one, which is what the churches have set up for themselves. So that's essentially what we're doing. And given that our entire movement is deeply spiritual in nature, then it actually aligns. We're not lying. We are setting up a new, you know, church, so to speak. I think less religious, more spiritual, you know, less dogma, more, you know, uh, you guys get all of that. So it's, it's an interesting world because I know you know, churches and religion and that whole realm has got a bad rap and probably it, it deserves that. But there is something interesting in this model, I think. So I'm just saying that because it took me a while to finally be like, okay, maybe there's something here. And then I've been talking with Will more. So I just share that because that was my experience in it in case that's helpful for people. Um, because whenever anything sounds too good to be true, you know, our red flags always tend to go off. Um, so anyway, if anyone has any questions. Yeah, and I just want thoughts, to express yeah. that yeah, right. My, my frustration has, has been like very apparent because I remember being present with you and Ronnie phoning up the SEC asking for permission to do things with seeds and high for DHO and you don't need to ask for permission. And this is, this is the thing. It's like regeneration is coming from our hearts and we don't need to ask permission from the people that are supposed to be protecting us. Um, um, with the so, amendment yeah. that uh, everyone who comes in needs to opt into that. So if you do do the spiritual ministry model, every single one of your members has to, when they sign up and say, yes, I want to be a part of this, they have to agree that they're stepping out of the protections of the nation state and into the rules, you know, governing this new organization. It's exactly, again, how churches operate today. You know, churches deal with their own, you know, you guys get this. Um, yeah, okay, and just cool. to speak to um Reiki, if I, if I may, and also Stephen has something to say, if you permit. I know you're facilitating, so it's up to you. Um, 
but just to speak to that about yeah it's very important that it's the me member to member so like each per every person involved is opting into being a member but that can be as easy as ticking a box when signing up signing out an application form just tick a box saying i agree to join the private membership association and there's a link to the declaration or whatever it is bylaws that you guys create for your own regenerative project and they're opting in as, as simple as that. Kind of like when you download Google and you agree to all their terms and conditions without really knowing what you're agreeing to. But um, it can be more conscious. We have the universe.org with like very, very simple process to follow to actually become a, a, an embodied member. Um, but it can be simplified. Over to Stephen, if we have the space for it, Raiki. Um, if you have any questions, put your hand up. So I'll make sure I call on you, but then yes, over to Stephen. Um, I just wanted to add one thing uh, to the list. I, don't, I, I didn't come with a big list of all my favorite things about the ministry. Um, but the favorite one that uh, Will didn't mention is uh, free speech. Um, right now, I did mention it. it was the very first one. Uh, oh, sorry. Freedom of speech. But I, I, just, okay, I just said okay, it. I I I I yeah, expand into that. So if you go with it, an old right world government structure to get your nonprofit status, um, if you register yourself as a church, as a faith-based organization, uh, and go to 501c3 and get recognized as a church, it's a status that can be taken away. And, um, you know, a big part of why I believe in Web3 um, is because of all the censorship in the, in the social media realm, how it's, how it's not easy to get uh, a true message of regeneration out amidst all the marketing and the censorship. Um, so that's why I so, so believe in the, uh, the 508C1A as a container for free speech and Web3 to enact that. Um, so if you believe in free speech and you don't want anyone uh, as an intermediary to have to judge whether you're, it's acceptable type of free speech, I believe this is the one and only container to pursue that Web3 and ministries. So, um, we have two hands up for questions. I do want to make one more statement. So the Universe Land Trust, as an ally, part of Regen Civics, has offered to help projects through this project or process, or even join the Universe as the most simplified model. So you can just opt into the Universe, and then you can follow the structure they've already built. So if you are interested in that, make sure you reach out to them and follow through. Okay, so Anders and then Roberto, and then we'll see how much time we have left. Well, hey, hey, gents, thank you so much for sharing this. Um, a, a, a small stack of questions, maybe you can answer them. Um, so I'm curious how you stack your 508C1A with other potential entities that, you know, or, or maybe they're not entities, but they're projects, you know, that are that are happening. And then also, because you're bringing on board many different projects into this, I'm curious how like my project is pr is potentially like protected from the activities of some other project that are doing something that might not be actually, you know, good for the whole entire creation. Okay. Um, so the first question is really simple. Um, with the EIN number, we can own assets and shares and stocks and land and anything. So. We do have land in the United States and in Guatemala and Nicaragua. We have shares in the UK. We have shares in Indonesia. Um, and yeah, we, we can own businesses. We can own nonprofits if we want to. But they are then obviously regulated by that company, that entity, whatever, whatever container it is. Um, the reason that has happened for us is we, I personally made an investment in a UK company and a, and a Balinese company, and I've given my shares to the universe ministry. So the ministry now owns shares in those companies. Um, the, the second question about protection. Um, so first and foremost, it's very simple to onboard a new organization once they've been through the, the process. We create meet, meeting minutes that swears them in as their organization. So that is effectively empowering them as a spiritual PMA within, within the universe ministry. Um, yeah, the, the, the next question, the last question you have is what happens if some organization does something damaging and how could that impact you as like a sub organization within it, right? How do we protect individual things within it? So I think this is a bigger question for me that I, I, would, I would like to revert to Teo, our legal representative, who's not here right now on how he would answer that. Um, but my understanding from my declaration is that unless we do something 
that is harmful, um, then like we we are very very protected. There's almost no no legal course or action that could ever ever be taken against us. Um, and once you become a member, you're actually opting out of the right to be able to sue us outside of our jurisdiction. You're, you're agreeing to, to handle matters within the community. Rather, you know, you're, you're effectively losing the right to be able to go to the old world system and use the courts to try and get access to some of our assets. Um, so the, these things are there to protect us and protect the assets. But I would love to know Teo's specific answer for that. Um, so if you give me some time, I can get a more official answer. Thanks. We're pursuing it with the highest intention. But it's a good question. Um, and I guess that would, if, if there are any concerns there, that would be a, re a good reason as to why to have more than one. You know. Yeah. Okay. Um, Roberto, over to you guys. Yes, um, we're looking into uh, this church and this kind of status as well. I was just wondering if it actually is valid that uh, you, if we would subscribe, for instance, to the ministry, um, for instance, one of the first example was the spirit medicine, the, um, the, sacred, medicine. the sacred medicines, yeah. And uh, but in Italy, that is illegal. So, like would be then able to actually still practice and say yes we are a church registered in the states but uh, and uh, so how does it work internationally basically so yeah in theory yes in theory if you stood up for your rights and you showed them the declaration and said you're a member of the universe ministry and you have the rights to work with sacred medicine they would have to accept that um it hasn't been tested or challenged or gone all the way to a court yet but if it did then we would stand up for our right and i can tell you from personal experience here in guatemala where it's very, very illegal to, to smoke marijuana or grow uh, psilocybin mushrooms. We are successfully growing mushrooms on our land. And we, both Stephen and I were actually caught by the police with marijuana. And we showed them the declaration and told them that we are ministers of the Universe Spiritual Ministry Church. We have the rights. They accepted that and left us alone. So we, we have personal experience of standing up for our rights and it, and it being... Okay, I think it's about education. If you know how to stand up for yourself and what to say, then you're protected. And if you don't, then, you know, they, they, they can do things, so. But like Reggie said as well, like this, this stems from Catholic church power. So of all places where that power ought to be recognized. Italy. <laughs> Italy ought to be high on the list. Okay. And I just wanted to make an observation that there was a separation between state and religion and now what's happening with Web3, we, we're getting the separation between states and money. And it's actually an interesting thing that now we're attaching money to religion <laughs> to, to create our own state. <laughs> and this, this touches on why I put promissory notes as, as one of the, the, the key benefits, because um, having the rights to create promissory notes means we have the right to create currency, which means we have the right to create tokens on the blockchain and it's just another like old world language to, to bridge the gap and help the understanding of why we have permission to, to create our own currency and we don't need permission i think smart contracts are just an extension of that they're a, a promise a, a permissory note that's coded in to a to computer system that anyone can see transparently um, I just want to take a small break because I was wondering if anyone left here was going to present today. I know Neil might have, but I saw that he stepped away, so we might have ran out of the time. So was anyone else here preparing something to share today? Tucker, were you as well? I yeah, I have a three page. I have a three page outline of all of the potential private and public legal entities that we've kind of gone over. Um, I'm more than happy to go through it. It would probably take me maybe about 10 minutes uh, or people can look through it on their own time. It is very easy to go through and it has like best use cases and stuff like that. Um, then let's, but it does kind of go right along. On, on... We'll have three minutes okay. from the game. We'll close up with Will, then we'll pass it to you and we'll be done at the half hour. And that way we're covering kind of like the whole spectrum here. Which Perfect. Is powerful. Cool, so over to the meeting. 
Oh, thank you. I just wanted to um, share um, uh, something happening in Germany right now um, with uh, um, what you can do um, with that thing William was sharing. So we have now a king of Germany. His name is Peter Fritzig. And uh, you should check it out. I mean, he has a whole kingdom and he can um, he is issuing paper um, like official papers, bank accounts and even travel documents. So you can get a passport, another German passport. And you can travel officially around the world with it. And he was working with free energy machines and a lot of crazy stuff, right? So with yeah. that, I just got to share with you here a link in the chat. It's like two, two years <laughs> ago, this report here. But um, there is a lot what is possible with that framework that William is sharing. So thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, I never thought I'd be thanking um, the church or the Catholic there's church another thing. or anything, but, well, you know, maybe this is the one thing we can thank them for, right? Um, and I do want to mention something that's in the chat for those who are just watching the recording. Tucker shared about the, whether or not it's legal to do illegal things, such as plants that for whatever reason are illegal. Um, he's saying that's only actually true under the U.S. Constitution, under the Freedom Rest the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1996. So if that a similar document like that doesn't exist in other countries, then maybe they don't see that same, you know, religious freedom to practice spiritual medicines. So it's probably highly advised to see if something like that already exists. UN. And also, yeah, anyway, well. Yeah, I was going to say it's a UN, a United Nations agreement. Um, there's the, something called the Hague Convention, um, which, which transfers the rights to, to other countries outside of the U.S., um, but I don't, I don't want to say what the absolute truth is. This is still an exploration and we're all learning. Um, but I personally am happy to test this in all of the countries that aren't on the blacklist. Um, and to, to yeah, face whatever comes up on, on the journey. Could, could you share a link to that UN agreement? That's news to me. I haven't heard of that one yet. Sure. I just wanted to mention that so that we're not maybe giving, you know, inappropriate advice here. Um, so definitely follow through with some of these sure. things for testing this out, I'm sure. Okay, so we got about 15 minutes left. I'm going to send it over to Tucker. You can give us an overview and then we can close out for today. Right on. Um, I don't think I'm going to be able to share my screen because I don't have a very good signal. Um, I can post the link in the chat if somebody else wants to and I can just read through it. Yes, I will but, share. Uh, this, I'll this whole conversation. Okay, perfect. So this, this whole conversation really goes right in line with uh, what Will uh, and Stephen were just talking about with this kind of discussion around uh, private entities and public entities. And so what uh, the Tioga community is doing and what I've seen work successfully with other communities is a combination of these private and public entities to achieve different things within community, such as owning assets or you know, uh, managing internal policies and, and bylaws or conducting commerce with the public, like businesses and stuff like that. So what I've done is I've created an outline of, of the different legal structures and legal entities uh, that we've talked about and that we plan to use and some of their good use cases. So I'll just breeze through them here. Um, so starting off with the private entities, and these are for private dealings and non-commercial organizations, we have uh, private members associations. Underneath that, you'll have uh, an example of a 508C1A, uh, which is a closed book, non-reporting, IRS registered, nonprofit, tax exempt, faith-based organization. Uh, and it is protected under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993 that we were just talking about. Uh, 508C1A is registered at the federal level and receives an EIN number from the IRS and can conduct uh, business through that as well. Uh, the best use case for this, in my opinion, is a faith-based private members association for management of internal member policies, bylaws, values, principles, and code of conduct. Uh, this would also include the organization's beliefs, practices, and common missions. And then you have a standard PMA or private members association with private agreements and bylaws. Uh, they can be registered at the state level if you're in the United States uh, with the secretary of state and can be paired with a private land trust to handle community governance policies in relation uh, to the community and its trust. 
It remains in the private and out of the jurisdiction of the SEC for issuance of tokens. And the best use case is for a private members association for management of internal member policies, bylaws, values, principles, and code of conduct. Uh, and then we have a private land trust. Um, so you have the, uh, there's two types of trust. You have a express trust and an applied trust. Uh, an express trust is really what we'll be working with. And that's uh, handled through like oral and written um, agreements. So in its most basic sense, a trust or any trust is a property interest held by one person uh, or multiple, the trustees, at the request of another, the settler, for the benefit of the third party, the beneficiary. So trusts have an awesome accounting system built into them uh, where trustees can issue certificates of beneficial interest and capital interest divided into shares as well as issue bonds and other obligations as freely as they can open a bank account, have a passbook and draw and circulate checks or make whatever other contractual obligations are allowed to persons as a natural right. Um, so this allows you to uh, issue shares and new shares um, without having to uh, file with the state or submit a filing fee or hire a lawyer or anything else. This can all be done internally. And this type of structure allows for a private and fluid internal accounting system for both capital interest and beneficial interest of the trust, states, and assets that can be represented as tokens on the blockchain. And because it remains in the private and out of the jurisdiction of the SEC, uh, we can do that uh, without um, going through the regulatory process. So the best use case for this uh, is sovereign and private ownership of land and other assets and the proportionate management and accounting of capital and beneficial interest of said assets for the benefit of one or many beneficiaries, i.e. the community. And uh, with PMAs and private land trusts and 508s, uh, like Will was talking about, you can declare uh, at the outset of the organization's creation which jurisdiction uh, you want to fall under, um, which is really key for what we are doing here. Now, that's that's what I have so far for the private entities. And then I'm going to just breeze through the public entities here. So these are for dealings in commerce and with the public. And they can also have relationships with the private entities, such as lease agreements and profit shares and other things of that nature. So, so I just want to we've got the right standard here. LLC. The difference between public and private for yep. those who might not get it. Private could be if any member, so if you have membership in your community and people opt in to your new realm that we're building here, or new economies that we're building, then you can set up the private organizations to manage that. And then we get to create up whatever rules we want because people are opting out of nation state rules and they're opting into these new rules we're making up. But if you wanna deal with people who aren't gonna opt out of nation state rules and they still want those protections and they're not willing to do that, that's where the public organizations come in, right? So that's kind of the distinction between those two. It depends on who you're dealing with. If it's all membership-based, you can do the private. If it's not membership-based, if it's open and you're you know, selling your shares openly to anyone who's watching Bloomberg or whatever the heck it is, you, know, you need a public company to be able to publicly sell things that people aren't gonna opt in to your membership-based organization. So that's kind of the big difference between the two. That's helpful. Okay, back to you, Tucker. And correct, correct and, and there is a difference between well, you're, you're, you're pretty much on point there. There is a little bit of a difference between selling shares publicly and, and just being a public entity. Like an LLC is technically a private company and you can't sell shares publicly, but it is still a, an entity that deals in commerce with the public. So when I say public entities in this specific use case, I'm talking about entities that are designed for dealing with the public and fall under the jurisdiction of the state or whatever public uh, entity or country that you reside in. So um, there, are, there is a C Corp, which, which is a public entity and that can be traded publicly on the NASDAQ and that's like a, the standard uh, United States corporation, like any company that you buy shares in on the New York Stock Exchange would be likely one of those corporations is C Corp. So, let me just uh, breeze through these real quick. We got just a couple here. So you've got the limited liability corporation. 
Uh, it's a popular US specific form of a private limited company. And it is a business structure that can combine the pastor taxation, taxation of a partnership or sole proprietorship with the limited liability of a corporation. Um, so it's a, it's a tax status, basically. It passes down the taxes to uh, the members, but still holds the liability, um, the limited liability of a corporation. Um, LLC, you guys are pretty familiar with LLCs. Uh, an LLC's membership interest or ownership typically is not freely transferable. Appro uh, approval from all members is often required. You can have as many members as you want, an unlimited amount of members in an LLC. And um, LLCs can allocate profit and losses on almost any basis that they want. Uh, for example, like a member with 50% ownership could be entitled to 90% of the profits uh, if that's what the organization decided at the outset. So the best use case for an LLC um, is for privately owned commercial businesses that do not plan on paying salaries uh, to their owning members. And that leads us to an S Corp, which has a little bit of a different tax um, classification that allows you to pay salaries to owning members. Um, and really the other major differences from with this and an LLC uh, is it is limited to uh, up to 100 shareholders and uh, S Corps also um, shareholders receive their profits and losses based on their percentage of ownership. Uh, for example, if you have 50% of the shares, you receive 50% of the profit and loss. So it's it's like kind of predetermined as far as that goes. Um, and a best, the best use case for an S Corp is uh, for private commercial businesses that shareholders total uh, no more than 100 individuals or US citizens or residents and would like to pay salaries to owning members. And then now we have the C Corp down here, which like I was saying before, it's the general corporation structure uh, in the United States. They're usually publicly traded companies owned by shareholders and C corporations are taxed at the corporate level and pass profits to their shareholders in the form of dividends. So a C corp is best used for publicly traded commercial businesses that plan to have more than 100 shareholders or wish for other corporations to be shareholders. Uh, and then we have the Dow LLC, uh, which you can open in Wyoming or Delaware. And then you can also uh, in any other state or any other country that uh, you can use US entities in, you can get a uh, certificate of authenticity uh, in that state or country. And then you can conduct business as a Wyoming or Delaware LLC entity. Um, and they're just specifically designed uh, as an LLC structure that's designed to be managed algorithmically or by a decentralized autonomous organization. Uh, and then the last one, which I've just started learning about as Lala Gardens and Neil and Letty have been going through this process is the LCA or the Limited Cooperative Association, which is in Colorado. And again, you can still conduct business in other places outside of Colorado, as long as you do your due diligence. Um, an LCA is a for-profit member owned Colorado state business entity that also follows the seven major cooperative principles. There's a link in here if you guys wanna go look at those. Um, and then, so an LCA operates with pluralistic purpose for the benefit of members to generate a profit and to tend to the interests of other stakeholders, including investors. And there's very, um, there's a lot of really lucrative financing options for LCAs and a lot of uh, in, like New York investors, um, have been using it as a really lucrative and sustainable um, fundraising vehicle for businesses. Um, so LTAs are member owned and democratically governed entities that seek to grow and operate sustainably for the benefit of their members and thus do not set out with the objective to uh, demutu uh, of demutualizing or undergoing a liquidity event. Um, so these are best used uh, for privately member-owned um, for-profit businesses with the intention of developing sustainable and profit profitable business models for the benefit of the members. So Tioga will likely be using a combination of private land trusts, um, 508C1A PMAs, and uh, LCAs and LLCs to go about the um, structuring of our community. Any questions? 
lots of questions I'll share with you later, but more of a statement. Thank you for this. This was the most cohesive and you know concise overview of all a whole bunch of different legal structures all at once. So you know, deep gratitude for putting this together. Thanks, Tucker. Um, over to Anders and then William. And if you again, if you have any questions, just put your hand up. Um, I'm really curious on how in the last statement, one of the last statements you made, you were saying that you're going to use like a combination of all of these things. Do you already have like a visual like mirror board or something like that to showcase how you are planning to use all of these and or could you create that and or like I think we should, you know, I think we as a collective should create all of our different ones so that we can look at how we're planning to use these in a different session would be super, super interesting. Yes, I I haven't finished putting together our full outline of how we're going to be doing it. It's forever evolving. I mean, I just learned about this new LCA thing this past week. So um, I'd be happy to put that together. But to give you like a 30 second overview, um, the land trust is really going to be just used for owning the land and handling our accounting of equity in relation to the land and the fundraising that we'll be doing through our members. The PMA, which will be closely related to the land trust and, and what is what kind of happens on the land, uh, will really just handle the bylaws, agreements, code of contact, conduct, and all of our governance. So that the, the PMA or the 508 um, will be basically what is directly linked to the DAO, all of our governance policies and the, the HIFA DAO tool. And then all of the other LLCs and LCAs and stuff of that nature will solely represent the cooperative businesses that our members will be starting on the community. And those LLCs or LCAs may also have a relationship with the trust via a lease on the land for the farm or a profit share or something of that nature. I hope that helped. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, Tucker. Um, and a deep, I know you've been on this journey for a long time. So again, deep gratitude for your openness to share these models and bringing it with us today. Uh, Will or Stephen, whichever one's got your hand up. Okay. Yep, it was Stephen. Uh, Tucker, I just had a question about uh, the B Corporation. That's uh, I'm, I'm admit I'm not familiar with the new LCA in Colorado, but uh, I was just curious how how it compared to the B Corporation. That was one of my favorites up until I learned about the 508 C1A. So I do know about the B Corporation, but I don't have any experience with it myself. I know it exists, but I did not feel. Uh, like I was knowledgeable enough to include that in my overview. Um, if you ha have some information about the B Corporation or would like to write something up and add it to this document, that would be awesome. But like I said, I just haven't dove into that specific entity yet. So I can't, can't answer that question very well. Um, I, I wouldn't say I'm super knowledgeable. Uh, I've never set one up myself or operated one, but it's uh, the, it sets up the structure for employee owned cooperatives. Uh, so for-profit or non-profit structures uh, that, that are, uh, you know, more private membership, internal uh, association type things. Um, but it sounds very similar to the LCA. I just didn't know if there were any added benefits to the LCA or not. Uh, and overall, uh, to be honest, it sounds like a, a lot of accounting and reporting to the old world that, that hopefully we won't do with the 508 C1A. But it's an interesting to pursue. Yeah, I, I'm actually definitely going to look more into that now that you say it's closely related to the LCA. That's okay. interesting. I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Um, great. Uh, we're at time boundary. We don't have any other hands up. So does anyone else have any last pressing things they want to share before we end our session today? Um, Will or Yes, Stephen, one more thing, Reiki. Yeah, if uh, I'd, I'd love to share this uh, this video conference after it's uh, after we're done, and uh, in the vein of doing things Web three, I was wondering if if, uh, if no one had any better recommendations for a decentralized platform. If, if perhaps you could uh, start an account for Regen Civics and post this on Odyssey.com, decentralized. 
Uh, it's, it's already happening, happening actually there's a seeds because i'm posting these all to the seeds youtube just because that's what i have and that's what's available and i just oh. and then it's automatically cross posting them to odyssey already so i could start sharing the odyssey links oh. um, i'm just more interested in like getting the message out and i know odyssey doesn't have any traction so it's already happening anyway but i just share the youtube ones um, but definitely, we don't want to be staying on YouTube very much longer. Um, never mind, YouTube algorithms, you didn't hear that. Wow, okay, so I know that was a lot. Like, all of these sessions have been a ton, and maybe that's just the point. It's, you know, drinking from a fire hose for this first, you know, episodes to kind of get a big context of what's possible here. And then just to wrap it all up today to help you, you know, not feel too overwhelmed. I will just go back to where we started before we close today. Uh, and then that's right here. So this is what we still want to accomplish before we get our crowd going. So again, today we just talked about legal structures, but I know it's gonna take some time, but if you have any questions on this stuff, please ask. And maybe once we get through the first round, you know, we'll talk about policies coming up and organization structures, et cetera, but then we'll wrap back around. And this is when the projects then have a chance to share what they've made. So I know we talked about doing that at the beginning of this season, where every project is going to have a chance to be able to share their legal structure or their project contributor guides, et cetera, and be able to have those sessions and dive into them. So having gone through this season one and figuring out you know, what flow is most appropriate, it seems like let's go through all of these once, the way we're doing it, and just information dump. And then we'll wrap back around and make sure we're all on the same page and we're checking these boxes off. Um, and again, if you have any feedback on this process, I mean, we're creating the process while we're living it, you know, please give me that feedback and I'll keep updating this roadmap as we figure out the best way to fill this season out. Um, so that was me kind of trying to ground this, <laughs> the complexity of what we're experiencing here. Whew. Okay, so thank you all. And now you can unmute yourselves, say goodbye, and I wish you all have an epic week. Oh, actually, last thing. I swear. Thanks. Um, some of you are present here today. If not, I'll ping you, and I've lost a couple of you. I need an image of your project with a logo on it because I'm putting out the introduction video for all the projects. So if you haven't got that to me yet, please get it to me in Discord so that your project looks beautiful on the video rather than generic. Um, so again, just give me a couple pictures that show your project, the outline of it, a picture from above, whatever you have that helps people get an understanding of what you're doing. All right, so now feel free to what kind of parameters, sizing, format, like square, what, what do you need? It doesn't matter because I'll change it. So I'm not being too particular. So I'll crop it to what I need. Just give me some pictures. Awesome. You guys okay. are incredible. Thanks, Raiki. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Love you all. Keep it going. See you next Very time. Fun. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.